Straight Talk from Israel. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. From miniskirt to hijab, living through and then escaping the Iranian Islamic Revolution and life in that country. Very, very interesting book that I just finished over the weekend. I'm holding the book in my hand. I really recommend this reading. It's it's not only educational, but it's interesting because you're reading about the personal life of somebody going through what it was like to be in Iran during the Islamic Revolution. Our guest is going to be Jacqueline Saper. She was born in Iran's capital city of Tehran to an Iranian father and a British mother. I must say, uh, also add here that she is Jewish. She was growing up in a Jewish home. In 1979, where were you then? When she was a teenaged 18 year old girl wearing makeup and mini skirts, going to the movies, going out with her friends, she eventually found herself living through the Iranian Islamic Revolution, which brought the fall of the Western friendly Shah who ruled the country of Iran. And he fell because of the civil unrest in the country, which drove him out. And the Ayatollah Khomeini came in, as well as Sharia law and a change in Iran, which now had become the Iranian Islamic Republic. If that wasn't enough, she also dodged bombs during the Iran-Iraq war. You know that eight-year war in the 1980s that was supposed to decide who would change the last letter of their country's name. Iran, Iraq, get it? And subsequently, Jacqueline, living in a second cl- as a second-class citizen in her country, in fear, only years later, and then with two children, was barely able to escape and make it to her, and make her way, I should say, to freedom in the West. We're going to find out her story and the lessons we need to see today, because we're going through a revolution, too. We'll be right back. The return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel was prophesied in the Bible thousands of years ago and is coming true today. Shalom. Join me, Josh Wander, on Israel Unplugged. Listen in as we delve into the spiritual and physical aspects of the Jewish return to Zion. We'll discuss the biblically mandated, historic, and of course practical understandings of this incredible transition from exile to redemption. That's Israel Unplugged, every Monday on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. Okay, we're back here at the Tamar Yona Show on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. Remember being in a room full of people together, tightly squeezed, and then leaning over your birthday cake and blowing all over it to blow out the candles, and then everyone eating that same cake you just blew all over? Boy, we were wild. And that was just less than one year ago. Today, doing something like that with the pandemic is almost unthinkable. So how much change can a year bring? And we wonder, how did we get here so fast? History doesn't wait for anyone. And today, we are caught up in a huge change politically, socially, and we can hardly remember what life was like before. But we're going to get a lesson today from someone who has lived through a quick change, 
And we're going to be speaking with Jacqueline Safe, uh, Saper. She is the author of the book, From Miniskirt to Hijab. Now, this is a deeply intimate and personal story, and yet eye-opening to what many of us are starting to see in the world, even today. There's so much to learn from her story, and her book has even won the 2020 Chicago Writers Association Book of the Year Award in traditional nonfiction. You will want to and should read her book. Welcome to the show, Jacqueline Saper. Thank you, Tamar. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. All right. So I, I uh, assume that people will be smart enough because if I'm recommending a book, it's really, really good because I read a lot of books. Um, I want to just jump past your background. I said in the beginning of the show that you had uh, parents. One was uh, your father was Iranian. Your mother was British. You were brought up in a Jewish family. You lived in what we say in Hebrew, Kol Tuv. You had uh, all the best. You had a very nice home and you had a very nice life. And uh, all of this went away. And, and I want to go straight into the beginning of the Islamic Revolution. Uh, again, the Shah was trying to westernize Iran and bring it into the yes. 20th century. His family made a law that women had to remove the hijab. They became equal to men. Iran was friendly to the West. And heck, it was Very even friendly so. with Israel. <laughs> Very much so, yes. And there yes. was air traffic was back and forth time. with passengers flying to and from Iran from Israel. So tell our listeners what happened. Well, um, as you mentioned, I grew up in the 60s and 70s, very Western, modern country, secular. And then the pivotal year was 1978. Um, in the about summer of 1978, the change began. Basically, Iran was like a pressure cooker waiting to explode. Shah means the king. He encountered the most resistance from the Shiite clergy. And they claimed that he was robbing the people from their culture, their re right, religious rights. And... Um, so what happened was in the mid summer of 1978, I was a, a 17 and a half years old and uh, the civil unrest began. It started with a movie theater in the south of Iran, in the city of Abadan. Uh, the movie theater, all the doors were locked from outside and set ablaze and over 400 people burned to death. They Horrible. died and that they, it was blamed on the, the Shah. And which till today we don't know who did it, but we can guess who did it. And then uh, on September 8th, there was a square in Tehran called Jale Square, and there were big demonstrations there. And the numbers of people killed was exaggerated. They say it was about 5,000 people were killed that day by the Shah's uh, uh, soldiers and police and that stirred up a lot of emotions and at this time uh, Ayatollah Khomeini the Shah's biggest nemesis uh, he was in France in 19 well let me just give you a quick history in 1964 uh, he had opposed the Khomeini had opposed the Shah's reforms one of his reforms was giving women the right to vote and uh, many, he stirred up a lot of riots and demonstrations. And in 1964, Khomeini was exiled to the neighboring country of Iraq. And he stayed in Iraq. And from there, he kept on talk, uh, um, expressing his opposition to the Shah. In 1978, Iraq expelled him out and he got asylum in France. And from a little village outside of Paris called Nofel Le Chateau, he steered the revolution. He um, uh, recorded his speeches on cassette tapes and leaflets. You know, it was uh, uh, in Iran, everybody knew where to go. He, he, he guided people where to go for demonstrations. And it just, the uh, momentum just took over. And people believed what he said. He, he promised a utopia, 
everything would be wonderful. And people believed him and they, all they wanted was the Shah to leave. And uh, they kept on giving the slogan, um, freedom, uh, independence, and an Islamic Republic. The problem was Iran or, or Persia, until 1935 it was called Persia, uh, had, has had kings and monarchies and dynasties for two and a half thousand years. And nobody knew what an Islamic Republic really meant. Uh, so finally, you know, we had months of uh, uh, civil unrest, martial law. Uh, you couldn't leave the house between 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. The country was at a standstill. Um, all businesses, companies, universities, everybody was on strike. The oil industry was on strike. I was a senior in high school. Um, there were no bus services uh, in between the cities, no planes. It was a chaotic time. Water shortages, long lines, food, gas. And everybody who could was trying to escape. The problem was the country, the whole of Iran, had only one international airport in Tehran, the capital city. And everybody was trying to get out. And finally, uh, the Shah left on January 16th. And two weeks later, actually, uh, February 1st, we just had February 1st, was the anniversary of Khomeini returning to Iran after 15 years of exile. Your father, though, didn't want to leave Iran. Mm -hmm. tell, tell our listeners why. Well, you know, my father was an academic. He was a university professor, and he was one of the optimists. Most people were more realistic. And, uh, you know, um, the problem was... Um, Many people, Iranian Jews, had had a lot of them had sons abroad studying, or they they were business people. They took risks, and my father was scared. To be honest, he was in his late fifties. He said, "Where shall I go? Where? How can I start fresh? I don't know what to do." And he kept on thinking. He he thought the Shah was invincible. Nothing could happen to the Shah. He was, in a way, a dictator, and and he had many enemies, and he had been a king for over thirty five years. So, and everything happened so fast. That's another problem. Everything was happening so fast. People were dropping everything, and he knew if he left his home, we had a beautiful three-story house, it would have been confiscated. Um, everybody was in, in a chaotic, um, a confused situation until after the revolution when Khomeini returned. He changed course. Whatever he had promised, he changed, and executions happened uh, of all the uh, people uh, associated with the prior regime. And one of the people mm. that they executed was Habib El Ghanian. He was a, um, a Jewish, honorary Jewish leader of uh, the Jewish community. He was a businessman, industrialist, and uh, they uh, arrested him. And uh, he had a very sh a show trial. And his, his, uh, he had... Um, business dealings with Israel. He traveled to Israel, which many people did before the revolution. He built uh, buildings in Israel, and he was ca uh, called a Zionist spy. And there was a sentence, wh whoever they wanted to execute, they said, sowing corruption on earth. And uh, they killed him. And that caused the Iranian Jewish community, uh, that, it was a wake-up call. And that was a catalyst for the mass departure of the Jews. This is very important what you're saying, because you're saying, number one, things went so fast. Number two, they yes. made an enemy out of the previous ruler with the Shah. And then they executed everybody uh, that they could that worked for the Shah that was in the other regime. And this, I, I'm not comparing it to America, 
but there are similarities that people should just have their antenna up. They chased out the Shaw, they uh, chased out and are still impeaching Donald Trump. Anybody who votes for Donald Trump or didn't vote for Joe Biden is considered today a domestic terrorist. God forbid, can you see even executions coming up? Nobody imagined in pre-revolutionary Iran that there would be executions. They thought they were going to get freedom. That's what they were promised. Instead, they got yes. uh, <laughs> terrible, uh, terrible know, things Shah, happening. The Shah brought a lot of uh, security to the country, but he did have a secret police called Savak. Yes. Which, um, he, you know, it was a one-man rule. Okay, hold um, it right there, uh, Jacqueline, sure. because we have to go to a break right now. And when we get back, I'm going to be asking her about the momentum, how it changes a population into a frenzy or how it can, and about the executions. We'll be right back. Hi, everyone. This is Andrea Simento from Jerusalem, inviting you to drop everything and join me on my show. Pull up a chair. We'll visit this week's quirky stories, meet fabulous guests, and discover my Israel. Together, we'll laugh, shout, and explain the topics that make us say, hey, we've got to talk about that. So get comfortable and pull up a chair with me, Andrea Simento, every Thursday on Israel News Talk Radio. All right, we are back here at the Tamar Yona Show on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. And our guest is Jacqueline Saper. She is the author of the book, From Miniskirt to Hijab, Living Through and Escaping the Iranian Islamic Revolution. And she's here talking to us about how societies can change, and so quickly. So on that note, Jacqueline, <clears throat> tell us about the momentum that was taking place in society and the fever among the people. Yeah, well, as I mentioned, there it was a curfew, and from 8 p.m., nobody could leave the house. So he had ordered the people, imagine, the whole country, I was in Tehran, everybody at 8.55 p.m. would turn their lights off, and they would go to the rooftops or their balconies. And remember, in the, in the Middle East, in Iran, rooftops are flat, and it's pitch dark. Everybody goes on the rooftops, and with from all their might, they would they would shout out "Allahu Akbar," "Allahu Akbar," which in Arabic means "God is great." Uh, by, by the way, Iranians speak Persian, but their uh, holy scripture is in Arabic. So they would scream "Allahu Akbar," and the the momentum of everybody screaming in the night for 15 minutes every night. I mean, I was scared. It was a scary feeling, but uh, it gave people uh, the the uh, bravery, and the, they got excited, and uh, everybody was looking forward to that 15 minutes. And uh, we we were. I didn't want to go. My father would not go up the roof and cry out Allah Akbar. So uh, we didn't know what to do because in the morning people would say you weren't there. And we had a, our house was a big house. The rooftop was pretty large. And my mother came up with the idea, tell the neighbors on the right hand side that we were standing on the left side of the rooftop and the other, the vice versa to the other neighbors. So that's how we survived. But my sister and her husband, her husband, my brother-in-law, he couldn't stand it. And he was scared they would come and loot the houses. It was a very difficult time. And then another uh, incident that happened was uh, one night I was sitting by my window of my bedroom and I saw a, a man uh, walking in the street. Now the it was just before the curfew, I, thought, I think. And then he kept on screaming in the street, uh, the imam's uh, in, is in the moon. The imam's is image is in the moon. And I looked at the moon. I said, is this guy crazy? What's, what is he saying? Anyhow, what happened was in the whole, I, I believe in the whole Iran, uh, there were people walking in the streets and claiming that the imam's vision is in the moon. And the next day, everybody had believed it. 
people were literally talking, educated people were saying, we saw the imam's vision in the moon. He is so holy that his, uh, his, uh, his face was in the moon. And people believed it. And this is a... This is what happened. They didn't just believe it, but they parroted it because that's what everybody was doing. And they wanted to be part of the majority. And they they said, oh, yes, I saw it, too. I saw it, too. Um, And so this momentum is taking place, this fever pitch among the people. And as as you said, I, I imagine it must be frightening to hear every night the screaming going on on rooftops all over Tehran and all over the country. Very scary, yes. And uh, the, eventually the Shah was chased out. He fled. And when yes. that happened, that opened up the way for the Khomeini to come in to Iran mm-hmm. and the uh, Iranian revolution, voila, it took place very quickly like that. And so uh, afterwards, of course, they want to purge the government – of anybody who was loyal to the Shah. And I I have to say this, that in your book, you were writing about how you would sit, you were sitting on the bus one day and you saw some graffiti on the seat in front of you, uh, derogatory to the Shah. And you were in shock because the Shah was like, uh, supposed to be loved by every, yes, godlike and supposed to be everyone, everyone's supposed to like him and love him. And, and then to see something like that shocked you because nobody ever said anything bad about the Shah. And then now, uh, they're going to be executing people. Tell us uh, very briefly about that. Well, there was a prime minister called Prime Minister Amir Abbas Hoveida. Um, he was executed, whoever who had not been able to escape in time. There was a um, minister minister of education. She was the first minister in Iranian history who was a female. My father would always say I sh- she was my role model. She, I sh- she should have been my role model. Her name was Farukh Roparsa. They executed her also. Um, it wasn't just the, uh, all the Savak agents were executed. Whoever they could get their hands on who, you know, who were associated with the prior regime, there were also um, other opponents like the MEK uh, group. They were, uh, they were very much against the new regime, communists, whoever they could. And yeah, that, that, those few months for the revolutionary course were very fast. In 20 minutes, they will trial people and execute them. It was a very, very difficult time to establish the new regime. The constitution changed. A lot of new laws came into effect. Um, uh, and, you know, Iran was a very modern country, but uh, the laws were very um, outdated. So it was difficult to, for people to accept. A lot of people didn't want to accept it. The family law laws were more, mostly in favor of men. And then we, Iran used to have um, very popular pop singers, pop music women singers all that was a prohibited band women cannot sing in public since the revolution you can dance in public you can ride a bike a lot of restrictive uh, laws and limitations well and then the hijab came you uh, were not even uh, a, a muslim and you were forced to wear a hijab Yes, hijab became uh, mandatory, is compulsory in Iran. And, uh, uh, you know, I was a Jewish teenager and I was forced to dress like an Orthodox Muslim woman. It doesn't matter what ethnicity, what nationality, what religion you have, you were forced. And when I was in Iran, hijab was very strict. One strand of your uh, your hair could have uh, you could have been arrested because there are morality police roaming the streets you know, reprimanding women to wear the hijab. and But it has relaxed since I have left. Now women wear colorful. It's still mandatory, but where women wear colorful colors, can show a bit of their hair, can wear makeup. But when I was there, it was extremely strict. When you were there, you could only wear black, gray, or... Brown or navy. Mm-hmm. And today they uh, have more rights, so now they can wear pink. <laughs> Well, you know, women are a lot of women in Iran are opposing the these laws. They're trying to, you know, uh, there are a lot of laws. Uh, for example, uh, uh, the right for divorce was to, for the man, but now what what women are doing? They having prenups before marriage that they could have the right for divorce. Mm-hmm. And up till 2019, uh, Iranian women who had married foreigners. 
their children would never have their mother's citizenship. But in 2019, they managed to change that law. So they're, slowly they're progressing. Mm-hmm. In the meantime, they're developing the uh, <laughs> the uh, an atomic bomb, nuclear weapons, and uh, I want to ask you very quickly now, we only have another two minutes before the break, but uh, what is with the Jewish population in Iran today? And I think that our listeners need to understand that the Jews who lived in Iran, a.k.a. Persia, uh, lived there for thousands of years, actually, since the Babylonian Biblical times. times. Yes. Right. Babylonian um, exile. Yes. So uh, two, we're talking thousands, thousands years. of years. Uh, and so mm-hmm. they really felt attached to Iran, um, or Persia, I should say. So what, what is with the Jewish population today? How many approximately are there, and what kind of uh, you know, life do they have? There was about... There was about 100,000 or more before the revolution 42 years ago. Now, if you just Google it, it shows, it tells you there's about 8,500 left. So as you can see, it's very much reduced, diminished. Okay, and the Jews um, still have to go today in Iran with the hijab? Jews? The Jewish people? Everybody. Uh Everybody from the age of six. When you go to first grade, all girls from the age of six, they have to wear hijab. Are they discriminated Everybody. against today, the Jews in Iran? Uh, you know, they they keep a low profile. The Jews and Christians and Zoroastrians are uh, called um, accepted religious minorities because they're people of the book, Jews and Christians. They can practice their religion in private. You can never wear a kippah and walk outside. You can never show your religion outside. But as long as you, they keep a low profile and very much keep themselves separated from Zionism and Israel and pretend that only Jewish, you know, somehow they separate themselves, keep a low profile, they're okay. They have their own schools. They have kosher butcher shops. They have, uh, you know, so... Um, but there, there are discriminatory laws against Jews can never be judges. They can't have high positions in the army. They can never be a president, stuff like that. Hmm, interesting. And this is the year 2021. Very, very interesting. All right. Well, when we get back, uh, we're going to, from the break, we're going to be speaking with Jacqueline about the lessons that we need to learn today to stave off oppressive governments and leadership to make sure that we can retain our inalienable rights and not just lap up the promises that are being thrown out to populations today in a, a in a revolution. I believe that what we're seeing happening today in America, we're seeing a Marxist revolution and people are being promised utopia, a reset, spread of the wealth. I don't think it's going to be anything like that in the end. So uh, this is something that we need to just have an, our antenna up about. I'm not saying that this is going to happen, but it could happen and it's ripe for it to happen. And we're seeing so many similarities with rioting in the streets, feverish momentum going on in America with silencing people, closing their bank accounts and uh, targeting people, making s- symbols of people. I mean, have you heard about the 10 stages of genocide? I'll do a show on that one day. We'll be right back. Are you interested in transforming your life, drawing closer to the Creator, and uncovering the deeper meanings and hidden treasures in the Hebrew Bible? Then join me, Rav Yitzhak Michelson, and me, William Hall, on the Science of Kabbalah, where we are seeking to narrow the gap between what we understand of our physical and spiritual worlds. So make sure to tune in every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Israel Time, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, here on Israel News Talk Radio. We are back here at the Tamar Yona Show on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. And our guest is Jacqueline Saper. She's the author of the award-winning book, From Miniskirt to Hijab, Living and uh, Living Through and Escaping the Iranian Islamic Revolution. I have the book here in my hands. Very interesting, very interesting uh story here about a girl in revolutionary Iran. And we hope to learn some lessons about what she went through 
and uh, and apply it to our lives today so we can be sure to stave off any type of uh, government that promises utopia and doesn't deliver. In fact, delivers uh, a, a nightmare rather than a dream. So, Jacqueline, um, w- when you were talking to us before about momentum and the fever and the group think that went on as the revolution was taking place, you were talking about people going up to their rooftops and screaming uh, Islamic prayers, and they expected their neighbors, even who were not Muslim, to do the same thing because you had this group think, and, and it was very, very powerful, and the Shah had to flee for his life, and you got the Khomeini, and today uh, we're seeing a... It's, it's not the same thing. It is not the same thing. However, revolutions and changes in a country are going to bring even more changes. And we're still seeing today something that a year ago we would never imagine, the silencing of people, the uh, uh, bank accounts, uh, closing closing bank accounts on people. Uh, We're seeing, you know, the the Khomeini, when he came, he became not only he did not go to a seminary, he took absolute power and he became the supreme leader. Mm -hmm. And it's an unelected position for life. He had it for 10 years because he was an elderly person. And in 1989, we got a new Supreme Leader, the second one, who is Ayatollah Khamenei. And he's been in this position, as I said, for 32 years. He's in his 80s. And just recently for the COVID vaccine, I can bring it up to date, um, he has made a, a speech on just two weeks ago, and he banned the imp- he has banned the import of any British and American made coronavirus vaccines to Iran. So there's no you know Pfizer, Moderna vaccines in Iran. People can't get it because he doesn't trust them. Um, so that's one thing. And uh, so I just want to say about- here, if you're pro vaccination, then this is something that you would say the, the government doesn't even care about its own people. They're so politically charged that because it's made by this person or God forbid the Zionist reg- regime, right? If, if we had come out with something, uh, we haven't yet, but we're working on something that so they wouldn't give it to their, their own, own people. They're making their own or getting it from Russia. Yeah, that's, that's the way it is. And uh, hmm. you know, after the revolution, Iran established the the Jerusalem Day called Quds Day. And on that day, they go in the streets. It's the last Friday of the holy month of Ramadan. And it's an annually, and they protest against Israel. And in 2020, the president, Hassan Rouhani, because of COVID, uh, he told Iranians to mark that Quds Day in their vehicles, not in marches. And so that's, I thought that was interesting, 2020 style in their cars. Can people leave Iran and make a life somewhere else or they're trapped in the country? No, 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 they're not trapped in the country. The problem is the country, the, there's very high inflation. The, mon- the, the economy is ba- in bad shape. The, the money has devalued so much that you don't get much for it. And the I- Iranians now need visas to go places. It's very difficult. And expensive to leave, and you know, and but what has happened is the highly educated uh, sector of society has Iran has a high brain drain. A lot of the educated have left the country, which is a shame, and uh, that's the problem. It's a very large country. They're very intelligent people, but. Uh, Whoever who can, um, a lot of them have left. Okay, so we're not going. We're not going to give away how you escaped, uh, but I do want to say that you had to escape because they wouldn't let people in your in your times. They wouldn't let people leave. They held people hostage. If you want, it was like the Soviet Union. You want to go visit uh, outside of uh, the Soviet Union? Leave your kids here. You know. I, when I was in Iran, uh, the, the years after the revolution, I was there eight years after the revolution. There was an Iran-Iraq war going on. And uh, as I said, it was the first decade was the harshest and most difficult decade. And the, unfortunately, the Jewish people uh, had a very hard time. There wasn't a written law, but it was a very difficult uh, to, for Jewish families to get a visa, to get a passport to leave the country. Maybe they would give it to the wife and not to the husband, or one spouse, not the other. It was very difficult for a whole family to leave. Right, they and kept a lot you of hostage. People left uh, illegally. Yes. Is it that way today? Desert. I'm asking. 
not not today. Today is much easier, but it's as I said, it's a. Uh, uh, with the the uh, deva- devaluation of the money and the getting visas, it's very hard to go. But as you can see, the numbers have come very low. You know, like the religious minorities in Iran have really reduced in size. And there's also the Baha'i community who are very much discriminated because they're not recognized as a minority in Iran. Hmm. And uh, Iran today has many ethnicities living there, different religions. Very, um, a lot of uh, religions and a lot of ethnicities. And uh, mm-hmm. Iran is a, has a very young population. When the revolution happened, there were 35 million. Today is almost 85 million. It is a very large country. It's a Honestly, it's a beautiful country with a rich history and culture. And Iranian Jew, Iran and Jewish people and Iranians have a rich and very long history together. You know, we have a lot of Jewish uh, sites in Iran, the Purim story, a lot of prophets were there, Daniel, Ezra. Our histories are very long and rich together. Where there's a lot of Persian holidays, not Islamic, but Persian holidays and Purim and pa- Passover are very similar customs because of their coexistence for so many years. So when you and were... The, the population of Iran is very young. I mean, the two thirds of the people are under 40, under 35. And with the advent of social media, they know what's going on outside the country. The world has become a smaller place. You know, they have apps, they have cell phones. So the world is changing rapidly. Hmm. And so with the last five minutes or actually less, the last four minutes that we have in the show, what would you, what lessons uh, do, do you want to impart to us that what we're going through today and what you, you may have gone through before in the revolution? Well, obviously Iran is not a democracy. Uh, so it's very different to the free world, but uh, the lessons are, you know, you, you have to be careful what you wish for. Uh, what the people wanted for the, for, with the revolution is really not what they got. But what the leaders of the revolution wanted for Iran to make it a very Islamic society, I think in a way they have failed too, because the new generation are really not the generation of their parents. Uh, for example, when the Iran-Iraq war happened, a lot of the uh, Iranians went volunteered to go on minefields and martyrdom was very much revered. I don't know if that war happened today, they would have the same outcome. I understand so that it, they drafted kids into the war, that they needed even kids. Yes, a lot of young kids went to the war. Uh, yes, it, um, it was a very brutal, unnecessary war that was prolonged for eight years. And unfortunately, many, many people died. And when you wrote your book, what made you want to write it? I mean, there are other people, there are many Iranians that live in the United States today that escaped the revolution. What made you want to write a book? Well, I I thought I had a unique story. First of all, I was a witness to history. I, I saw a lot that needed to be told. Uh, second, I, I because of my age, I came of age in pre-revolutionary Iran. As I said, Iranian Iran has had uh, um, many Iranians today don't even know what pre-revolution Iran looked like. So I, I was an adult when the revolution happened. I'm not writing from a child's point of view. I was 18, and then uh, I was Jewish, so that's unusual. And I was bicultural. I am half half Ashkenazi British. So in my parents' generation, bicultural, bi ethnic uh, Jewish marriages never happened. You know, so I think our family was the only one. And I stayed. And while most of the Iranian Jews fled the, uh, immediately after the revolution or during the revolution, I stayed for eight more years. I had been married there, I had two children there, and my husband was a doctor, and every year he served one month at the war front, at the field hospital. So I have a lot of stories, and I have documents, letters, photos, everything to prove uh, what I'm saying. And I think it's important to add that it was controlled what you were allowed to see and watch after the revolution. No more Western programs on television. It was only watching imams uh, speaking. They became your celebrities, the imams, and how uh, right. how oppressive it was for people. And as you say, people forget. They forgot what Iran was like. And I, I'm afraid that today, 
day people, even just a year ago, we forgot what it was like to be able to blow on a birthday cake and nobody thought anything about eating it afterwards after you blow all over a birthday cake, you know? Uh, so much is happening and changing. So I want to urge everybody to get their hands in this book. Again, I'm holding it in my hands from Mini Skirt to Hijab, A Girl in Revolutionary Iran by Jacqueline Saper. You can find it on Amazon. Ja- uh, Jacqueline, do you have a website you'd want to give out? Yes, it's my name. It's uh, Jacqueline. You know, I was named after Jacqueline Kennedy. So I was born in the 60s. So it's the same spelling, a uh, long name, Jacqueline Saper.com. All right. And I really do recommend this book. It was interesting reading. It really flowed. I read this in like two days, the book. It was very, very good. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Jacqueline Saper. God bless you you. and much success on your very important award-winning book that really everybody should read. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye. If you love Israel News Talk Radio, then you'll love our Facebook page. We keep you up to date on what's happening in Israel, plus little surprise treasures that we don't share on the radio. Go now to follow us on Facebook. Just look for the Israel News Talk Radio Facebook page. And don't forget to subscribe and follow us by clicking on the like button. We post great stuff there that you'll want to share. Israel News Talk Radio on Facebook and Israel News Radio on Twitter. If you're hearing this message, everyone else can too. Advertise with Israel News Talk Radio and get your message out to people. We'll build a personalized package for you. Contact advertising at IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. Straight talk from Israel. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. Hey, this is Jake in Anchorage, Alaska, and I love listening to all the super interesting interviews and up-to-date information on what's happening in Israel. Hello, this is Anna King, originally from London, now living in Israel. And what can I say? Israel News Talk Radio is my cup of tea. My name is Bhaskar. I'm from India, and I love listening because you get to know the truth and wonderful voices from this lovely country. Mom! Okay, wait a minute. Hi, this is Chava Dax, and I'm calling for the rolling hills of Malaya Dumim, just north of Jerusalem. I always listen to Israel News Talk Radio to get all the latest news and commentary and to keep me up to date every day. This is Sarah Dax from Malaya Dumim, and I'm 12. I wish Israel News Talk Radio was boring so my mom wouldn't listen to it all the time. Mom! You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. News, opinion, and more. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. 